Um, Jonathan Corrin, uh, a good friend and colleague uh, at UCLA, was originally scheduled to come up and join us in person, but that didn't work out this year. Uh, but we'll invite him next year to come in person. So um, very interesting talk this morning, biologics and asthma is disease remission possible. Jonathan, go ahead. Thanks, Lynn. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you, at least um, by Zoom, if not in person. But this is cer certainly a topic that I've thought a lot about, uh, had a lot of discussions about, and in trying to sort of frame an approach to how to answer this question, it comes with great difficulty because we're operating really with a paucity of information. So this is really a hypothesis building more than anything. And as an overview, I guess the first question is why focus on remission and asthma? Is it really a question that needs to be answered? The second being what factors are acting as real obstacles to achieving any possible remission? And then finally, how does treatment really affect long-term indices of asthma? And do we see any kind of a signal pointing towards the possibility of remission with current therapies? So let's come back to that first question. Why should we focus on remission and asthma? And part of it <clears throat> stems from the fact that in other disease states, this has become an active discussion. I think this all started in cancer. And for obvious reasons, these are fatal diseases very often. And Certainly, you'd like to get people to a point in therapy where they don't have a recurrence. And it was noted that successful treatment in some cases led to the absence of recurrence. And it was certainly related to the type of cancer and the stage of cancer. And as this moved into inflammatory diseases, rheumatologists began to talk about remittive or disease-modifying therapies. And you know, very early on in this discussion, there were inflammatory conditions that were treated symptomatically primarily with aspirin and other NSAIDs. And certainly at that point in time, people recognize that you could get some control of symptoms, but persistence of inflammatory markers and persistence of progression, uh, particularly following x-rays of patients as they lost bone mass um, and joint space in patients who had rheumatoid arthritis. But then as they moved before we did into the realm of biologic therapies targeting you know, specific molecules, they found out that not only was complete control of symptoms possible, but you could begin to ebb your way towards a, a prevention of disease progression. And these started to become viable goals. And this we're talking back in the 1990s. And as we move into our own field, we talk about some of the asthma treatment goals that we've held since you know, the 1960s. We recognized that there was bronchospasm present we didn't recognize there was inflammation. And as we sort of take this forward, some of these goals, we get to the point in the 2010 where we are trying to really get personalized medicine to the point where you can prevent intervention or prevent kind of exacerbations, reduce symptoms, and, and perhaps achieve complete control. And if we see how these various medications match these goals, we can see really the, the Sentinel medication in sort of driving this uh, this goal of trying to achieve complete remission was back with the advent of anti-IgE therapy. Um, and then we began to recognize that there was such a thing as eosinophilia as a treatable trait. And, and then with the advent of new medications, anti-IL-5s, anti-IL-413 drugs, and most recently anti-alarmins, um, we began to think that individualization of therapy might achieve long-term inflammatory remission and potentially long-term disease remission. So how do we define remission in the literature? And, and Andy menzies Gao has you know, been very instrumental in trying to frame this discussion. The first is a clinical remission. And I think most of us are, are familiar with that. And we occasionally see it in our patients an absence of symptoms, lung function optimization, maybe not return to normal, but whatever their maximum appears to be, they do reach that point and then maintain it over time and the absence of use of systemic steroids. That doesn't indicate that the patient is off medications. Complete remission would be these same criteria plus objective resolution of inflammation and normalization of bronchial hyperresponsiveness. 
And then finally, remission off treatment, all of these under complete remission, but maintaining this state while the patient stops all therapies, including potential biologic treatments. You know, what do patients consider to be most important? And I think that one would be fairly obvious. They look at symptoms as really the key to the, this puzzle. And if we look at bright maroon indicating essential trait, dark blue, a number four, and then three, two, one, down to what patients would consider to be a low priority. We can see that nighttime symptoms or patient self-assessment of asthma control really sort of dominate patients' thinking. More, more than 60% of patients believe this is the essential part of, of having a remission if they were to have one. And then if we look down at the bottom, it's interesting, things like activity limitation or even dyspnea with exercise are considered to be much lower priorities than the above symptoms. So there have been studies that have looked at the issue of spontaneous remission in patients with asthma. And there's one five-year study, this was published on in 2018 in Jackie. They took a sample of 200 patients who had recent onset asthma less than a year. Asthma remission was defined in the study by an absence of symptoms for greater than a one-year period with no asthma medication use for the same period of time. Patients were followed prospectively for five years, 170 patients completed the study. And what they found was that about close to 16% had spontaneous remission during this period of time. And we do see occasionally these patients. And the real question is, how often does this remission state become a stable um, thing? And when you look at some of the cl key clinical factors increasing the probability of having persistent asthma not going into remission, it's patients who are of older age, particularly if the asthma develops at an older age, worse asthma control, higher doses of controllers, particularly inhaled steroids, a more severe degree of airways hyperresponsiveness measured by methacholine, a higher prevalence of nasal polyps, and interestingly, a higher level of blood neutrophils, but not eosinophils. So, if we, if we turn to this issue of nasal polyps as an indicator of asthma persistence, um, this is a, a study that looked at the same issue. And what we're looking at um, are the presence of nasal polyps and severe bronchial hyperresponsiveness as indicators of whether asthma would remit during this five-year period in that same cohort that we just looked at. And, and we can see that the red is the actual clinically observed remission if you take people who have no nasal polyps and mild BHR as indicated by the fine dotted blue line, you can see what the modeling shows us. But alternatively, if we look at the very top two brackets, um, patients who had nasal polyposis with severe or even mild bronchial hyperresponsiveness, the nasal polyps really seem to be a big indicator that asthma will be a persistent finding in these patients. Now, of course, we recognize that some patients will get much better to the point that they stop medications. These patients typically are milder and younger. But one of the questions remains is, will they relapse? And in a sample of 309 patients, this was published a couple of years back, who had recent onset asthma, asthma remission was defined as an absence of asthma symptoms for a year and no medications. And patients were followed for a longer period of time, in this case, 15 years and 205 patients were able to complete the entire trial. And what we see is from the point of recruitment on the very far left, and you know, we see a follow-up, um, which was done prospectively, um, planned prospectively in 2003, and then again between 2012 and 2014, we can see of these patients, 12 go into remission. We then see that about half of these patients have a relapse. And then at follow-up later, we again see another period of time during which patients again achieve remission. Um, so people seem to do better over time than having these relapses back to active disease. And again, looking at the factors that affected persistence, higher BMI, lower FEV1 at baseline, higher bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and again, higher blood neutrophils. So the neutrophil seems to be a finding that stood up in a couple of different studies. So what are some of the factors uh, that we really face when we try to achieve remission in patients? And I think if we kind of look at a very high level, 
what are the factors that regulate the development of asthma? Um, genetics, certainly. Gene environment interactions that are ongoing through a patient's life, not only at the onset of disease. And the development and persistence of inflammation and how that inflammation might potentially change as the airway attempts to heal itself. So if, if we turn to the issue of genetics, and you certainly have someone in your neighborhood, Matt Altman, who's done some tremendous work looking at genetics in populations of children who develop asthma. If we look at European patients and patients of African descent, there appear to be different uh, gene loci, which are important in the development of asthma. And some of the genes that stand out as being most important in European patients are the gene for TSLP, uh, for IL-33 and its receptor SD2, and for M ORMDL3, GSDMB, um, which are a couple of other genes that we're not sure of the functionality exactly, but we do realize that they're tied into the development of asthma. Somewhat different in patients of African descent, PIHIN1, which is an interferon-inducible protein X, uh, again, seems to be perhaps one of the most important dictators of asthma, at least in some of the data that I've reviewed. And what's interesting is when you look at the differences in gene expression uh, across age from patients who have child onset asthma versus those who develop adult onset, they seem to be fairly similar. Um, so it isn't as if you end up with a completely different gene set that drives the development of late onset asthma. So without the environment and without you know, methylation potentially as a way of changing the expression of these genes, um, you really wouldn't necessarily have gene expression. And when you look at some of the neonatal immune cells, there are 600 differentially methylated regions that seem to be very important in distinguishing children who later develop asthma, at least up until age nine. And again, we see the importance of ORMDL3 and GSDMB um, which seem to be affected by local CPG methylation. Um, and if we look at what are some of the factors in the environment that ultimately lead to this methylation or perhaps other changes that, that lead to important expression, paternal smoking um, induces an IL-1 receptor antagonist gene, early life allergen exposures, particularly animal danders and dust mites have been the most heavily studied. Um, seem to cause a number of gene interactions across a large number of genes. Um, so certainly these interactions, when they're present and as they change through life, um, seem to have an effect at least on the initial development of asthma. And I think another factor that's important to recognize is that as the predisposed child or even young or older adult begins to develop these diseases, there's an important interaction between atopy or allergy and what's going on at the level of the epithelium. And, and certainly we know that epithelial dysfunction with gap junctions that are faulty, with easier penetration of proteases and, and allergens through the epithelial barrier um, may lead to um, reprogramming or, or promotion of a phenotype of dendritic cells that allow the body to form allergen-specific Th2 cells and ultimately um, allow us to enter the state of allergy. And, and of course, both of these factors lead to the development of type 2 inflammation, but type 2 inflammation feeds back to both of these, particularly type 2 inflammation and the effects of IL-4 and 13 on the epithelium with ongoing degradation of the integrity of the epithelium, allowing more penetration and more activation of the epithelial cells. So if we take kind of a quick snapshot at how does epithelial dysfunction and asthma really lead to the state of type 2 inflammation? Certainly there's, there's junctional proteins that we've talked about. There's damage of the epithelium that we've talked about. There's type 2 inflammatory cell products, um, including IL-4 and 13, but also very importantly, the eosinophil-derived cationic proteins like ECP and MBP that, that really impair the integrity. And at the end of the day, very central in this process, shown in white, are the release and synthesis and release of these alarmins, including IL-33, IL-25, and thymic stromolipopoietin, all of which really get the inflammatory machine to the point where you have persistent type 2 inflammation. 
And if we sort of summarize this type two inflammation very briefly, um, we can see the central role of the alarmin shown in the center, TSLP, IL-25, and IL-33, two very important roles on cells that will lead to the generation of cytokines. In the center, certainly the ILC2 cell, an innate cell um, that can be activated particularly by TSLP and IL-33. But then on the right side, the diseases that we work with, um, the promotion of surface molecule expression on dendritic cells that then allow an interaction with naive T cells, and in the presence of IL-4, the generation of allergen-specific Th2 cells, hence the, the development of atopy, which will probably persist through a person's life. And we can see on the left-handed side how these same alarmins have a very powerful effect on other innate cells, including eosinophils, mast cells, and, um, and basophils. So, if we, if we look at this question, how does treatment of asthma really affect asthma remission? And, and this really is a discussion that dates back to the early 2000s when Eric Bateman wanted to determine how many people could achieve complete control on therapy. And when we review the data with inhaled corticosteroids, unfortunately, despite using medium to high doses persistently with good adherence, most of the early studies showed that there was a failure to achieve real remission of disease, even on therapy. And even though there are powerful signals showing that both bloody eosinophilic inflammation to some degree was reduced, but particularly inflammation locally, determined by bronchoscopic specimens, um, along with levels of bronchial hyperresponsiveness, all of these things persisted and when inhaled corticosteroids were stopped, um, no matter when they were instigated, the disease did recur upon the stoppage of therapy. And more recent studies um, are now looking at long-term effects of biologic medications. And rather than looking at some of the studies that we looked at early on, where we've taken a group of patients with disease for less than a year, what's now being considered is, can you take somebody with long-standing poorly controlled asthma uh, with a high burden of disease and a large amount of medication requirement and, and potentially envision that that patient might be completely controlled even off of therapy. So I mentioned Eric Bateman, and this was really a very important study published back in 2004 in the American Review of Respiratory Disease. And, and just to refresh your memory, they took three cohorts of patients, patients that were really mild off of all therapy, patients who were on some dose of inhaled corticosteroid with or without a long acting beta agonist, um, and then finally patients who came really on maximal therapy. Um, these patients were then randomized to either, and if you look at each of these, we can see FP and SFC, reticosome propionate, or, or cell metarol to reticosome propionate combination. And each of these groups was then started at the lowest dose of 100 slash 50, increased to 250, 50, or then 550, or a corresponding dose of reticosome all by itself. And, and what we're looking at, phase one is the up titration of the dose of their treatment. And in shown in white, in gray, what we're looking at is whatever dose they achieve their their maximum control therapy, whether it be the lowest, the medium, or the highest, they were maintained on that for a period of about six to eight months. And what we're really looking at is the percentage of patients who had complete asthma control, where they were essentially off of their beta agonist um, on an as-needed basis, had stabilization of pulmonary function, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness was not looked at in this study. But we can see at the far left in group one, even patients who came into the study relatively mild on no treatment with salmeterone fluticasone combination, we're looking at about 50% of patients after a year of treatment that were really in that category. And as you go to more severe levels of asthma in stratum two and stratum three, you see that the possibility of achieving this goes down even further. And as you might expect, the people that come in on maximal therapy and are still symptomatic, when they finally reach that same level of therapy in a randomized fashion, you can see that the levels of remission are in the order of 20 to 
So on the right hand, what we're really looking at are the exacerbations um, in each of these groups as they went through the study and not unexpectedly, steroid naive patients really have, have much rarer, less frequent exacerbations compared with those patients that have more moderate to severe disease. So that leaves us with the impression that no matter what we do with what we would call standard of care and health therapy, and by the way, adding LAMA has not made a significant impact on, on these sorts of numbers. What we're left with the idea that we really would like to achieve much more in trying to get patients who, who have a heavy burden of disease and are really rendered somewhat dysfunctional by the presence of asthma. And when we look across the board at people who are on typically standard care therapy or even a biologic, about 50% of adults have um, uncontrolled disease. Contributing factors, as we would expect, poor adherence to inhaled therapies is really quite instrumental. Um, many studies showing that adherence to asthma therapy is in the neighborhood of 40 to 50%, no matter what we do. Continuing allergen and trigger exposure, which we would expect, particularly in patients who are dust mite allergic, where they have chronic exposure, but others as well. Uh, patients who have non-type non 2 inflammation, uh, which we know is innately resistant to corticosteroids, and, and we have not really had a good fit for this to date. And in type 2 inflammation, where we see those people as well who have very high blood eosinophil counts, who despite using inhaled corticosteroids and even oral corticosteroids at low doses are very difficult to control. And if you summarize all this, in the United States, about one in 10 patients is chronically oral corticosteroid de dependent, and about one in three patients continues to get oral you know, courses of steroids on a recurrent basis when you follow them for, for months to years at a time. And, and added to this is a growing literature that um, oral corticosteroids, even when given as two to three courses, and we're talking about a, a gram of steroids over a lifetime, that there are increased odds of having a fracture, of having eye disease, of having cardiovascular disease. And, and it really makes us take you know, a, a second look at patients who say, well, I only get one cor cor course of oral steroids a year. I'm doing pretty well. And rethinking if they do this from age 10 or 15 onward, you know, what are we doing to them in terms of long-term uh, associated diseases? So when we continue our sort of examination of corticosteroids, and, and this was a paper published out of UCSF a couple of years back, where they looked at type two cytokine expression in the presence of corticosteroid treatment. And we're comparing a group of healthy controls to pre-corticosteroids to post-corticosteroids and looking at standardized gene expression of a cluster of type two genes. And, and what we can see is that there are a lot of people even with corticosteroids or following corticosteroids where there is not a suppression even when corticosteroids are given in pretty good dose. So, so we certainly know that these type two inflammatory processes going from the alarmins all the way down to the effector cells may not be controlled with, with current standard of care treatments, which, which now leads us to these newer medications starting with omalizumab developed almost 20 years ago. And if we, we quickly just summarize what we know, the target is IgE, it's for an allergic phenotype, nepolizumab and rustlizumab both bind to IL-5 as their ligand. And for an eosinophilic population, as is denrolizumab, but somewhat different, binds to the IL-5 receptor. Dupilumab, the IL-4 receptor, which is shared with the um, alpha chain, the IL-13 receptor. And then most recently, um, tezapelumab, which binds to TSLP and has not been given any kind of phenotypic bracketing by the FDA. So when we, we talk about remission, we know that we have patients where there's an immune process that's ongoing, and that would be the majority of asthma, asthmatics where allergy seems to be one of the driving forces of the disease. And the goal would be to achieve tolerance in those patients and tolerance having potentially an effect on the inflammatory circuitry, going from the epithelial release of alarmins um, down to sensitization of T helper cells 
to release their cytokines. And these two things certainly have an effect upon each other. So let's talk about IgE and the blockade of IgE and some of the mechanistic effects that you might speculate could have an effect on tolerance and potentially disease remission. And we certainly all have patients who have been on omalizumab for an extended period of time. Some of them have come off after five to 10 years. And, and there is a small percentage of people who seem to continue to do well. And the, the obvious effect of, of omalizumab is that IgE-mediated mast cell activation is blunted by stripping away IgE from the surface of these cells. Um, IgE um, modulates interferon release um, with a reduction of the presence of, of IgE reduces alpha and gamma interferon release, leading to an increase in viral infections. Blocking IgE should have an effect on this and has been shown to do so. Something we don't think about much is IgE facilitated antigen presentation, something that was described by Steve Durham, wherein B cells actively use IgE to present allergen to T cells, and that in, with the reduction of IgE, this, this function of B cells acting as antigen presenting cells is markedly diminished. And again, something we don't think about, but, but once did, is that there's an important modulation of CD23 on B cells by IgE. And in the absence of IgE, um, CD23 expression is reduced. And, and that CD23 expression is, is very important in trying to achieve tolerance. So if we, if we look at the mechanistic changes with omalizumab, we know there's a reduction in allergen-directed IgE down below the limit of detection. There is an increase in viral-induced interferon release. There's a reduction in facilitated antigen presentation, which importantly seems to augment the effect of allergy immunotherapy. So this becomes an important pairing of treatments. And there is a reduction in CD23, but no reduction in IgE class switching. So even though CD23 seems to be important going from IgM to IgE expression on these cells, we've been unable to show that that actually happens in vivo. Um, there is efficacy during long-term treatment. We'll look at that. And, and there is some efficacy after stopping treatment. Um, there's been a number of small series, you know, five to 10 patients. One larger study of 61 patients um, did use a subjective non-standardized criterion for assessing response. And we'll look at that as well. So when we look at the effects of omalizumab um, after stopping treatment, this is from the export trial which was published in 2017 by Dennis Ledford. And patients who completed a five-year course of treatment, um, it was called the Excels. there are 176 patients. They were randomized to either continue omalizumab after five years or switch to placebo. The primary endpoint was exacerbations and IgE was monitored. And if we now look at the percentage of patients who are free of severe asthma exacerbations, what we find is that irrespective of whether they go back to omalizumab and continue or switch back to placebo, um, both of these groups continue to have exacerbations. And if we look at it over a period of, of several weeks, um, the number becomes increasingly large. So even with that prolonged duration of therapy, and here we're looking at a total of six years of treatment, there really is, is no real change. And, and of course, we look at placebo, um, did IgE remain suppressed after five years of treatment? And in fact, in the placebo group, in the, in the green box, there was an increase significant in pre-IgE. And in the presence of omalizumab, there was a slight increase, um, which, which may be sort of errors around the, the, the signal bar. But, but certainly, after five years of treatment, these B cells are continuing to make IgE. We don't see either immunologic or clinical remission here. Um, so what about interleukin-5? So this is certainly a, a class of drugs. It was really the first major biologic that, that came to the fore after omalizumab. And, and these are drugs, and this is a cytokine, that really doesn't have a lot of effects. There are important effects, and they have important effects on certain subsets of asthmatics. But interleukin-5 acts on eosinophilic progenitor cells. Um, leading to maturation. So it's very important the activation of these cells and survival 
and chemotaxis of these cells and allowing those, those mature eosinophils to not only produce cationic proteins, which have a strong effect on the epithelium, but a, a very important role in releasing Th2 cytokines, which perhaps is why in patients with very high levels of eosinophilia, those, cytok those eosinophils may be important sources of IL-4 and 13, um, leading to some of the more protein effects of asthma. In terms of the basophil, it too is, is primed by the inner presence of interleukin-5, and basophils are thought to play a role, certainly in some exacerbations in allergic patients, even though they're very small in number. So if we review some of the mechanistic and clinical changes in asthma, with mepolizumab, on average, you get about an 80% reduction in blood eosinophils. Um, investigators who have worked with the drug um, have argued in the past that a certain number of eosinophils actually are important to, to maintaining um, good health in the tissue. Fenrolizumab, because it basically binds to the receptor for IL-5, um, resulting in apoptosis, you get very close to 100% reduction with a 75% reduction in blood basophils. So it's having an effect on more than one cell. Uh, efficacy during long-term treatment has, remission has really not been accessible um, since they haven't really looked at endpoints in a meaningful way. Um, what about after stopping treatment? Mepolizumab uh, was examined after three years of treatment and there was an increase in exacerbation rate as well as asthma control questionnaire scores. And with benralizumab, where you might believe the effects could be better, uh, there are really no trials of efficacy in looking at any of this in a post hoc way after stopping long-term treatment. So if we, if we turn back to mepolizumab, there was a long-term study with an extension called the Columbus study. Um, a fairly good number of patients, 347 patients, who had previously been treated with mepolizumab were now looked at one year after stopping their ther therapy and they continue to be followed out for about three and a half years. Uh, there was a 61% reduction in the annualized asthma exacerbation rate um, while on treatment compared with baseline. 33% of patients had no exacerbations during the trial period. Um, FEV1 improvements that were initially seen were lost by the end of the trial and they really didn't combine their endpoints. So what we're looking at is as we go on the far hand upper right box uh, from pretreatment to on treatment to off treatment, we can see that off treatment exacerbations um, did not return to their previous level, but continued, um, but continued to occur. And then when patients went back onto treatment, what they were able to show was that there was again, a further reduction in exacerbations, but not a complete squelching of exacerbations. And if we look at ACQ5, we again see that patients um, who were on treatment did have an improvement, but this never really disappeared completely. If we look at the long-term efficacy with venralizumab, and again, this is not with stoppage of therapy, um, a large group of patients, 1,576, uh, two-thirds of whom had eosinophils greater than 300, who had previously been treated with venralizumab for a period of a year were entered into an extension without a break in therapy. The study was one year duration. 72% had no exacerbations during the trial period. And FEV1 was maintained in patients previously treated with venralizumab. So the effect on FEV1 to venralizumab seemed to be somewhat better and more consistent over time during treatment. But keep in mind, we're not looking at any period where people were off of therapy. We're really trying to gauge whether there was remission on treatment. And certainly people improve significantly, but we're not seeing um, complete remission in these patients. And if we then return to the issue of mepolizumab and we ask the question, what happens if you continue versus stopping treatment? And in the thick gray line, we're looking at continuing mepolizumab. In the thinner line, we're looking at stopping mepolizumab with switch to placebo. And again, we see that um, there is some efficacy which is maintained, but certainly uh, patients are not in remission. 
So given the fact that you know, eosinophils play a role as an effector cell, but probably not an orchestrating cell, um, or in, in IL-5 being really a mediator that leads to eosinophilia, but doesn't really have a lot of other effects, we then have turned to other potential cytokines as a way to envision how we might get long-term control both on and then potentially off of treatment. And if we look at the mechanistic effects of IL-4 and 13, just to summarize and review, IL-4 and 13 have a very important effect on the goblet cell, um, both in terms of upregulating the um, transformation of these cells from fibroblasts, as well as the increase in the secretion of mucus. Uh, incredibly important effects on smooth muscle um, with an increase in bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Um, effects on the vascular endothelium with an upregulation of VCAM1 as well as uh, release of eotaxin, um, which is very important for drawing eosinophils into the airway. Uh, B cell, of course, IL-4 playing a critical role in switching from IgM to IgE. And it's something we don't think about much, but the role of IL-4 in maintaining a population of memory TH2 cells that are allergen specific, which will certainly persist for a very long time. And I think it's this far-handed, this, this far-right phenomenon that, that really makes trying to achieve immunologic remission a very difficult task. So when we look at dupilumab, um, we see a reduction in exhaled nitric oxide and IgE by virtue of their effects on IL-13 and IL-4 respectively. Um, initially, we see an increase in blood eosinophilia in the first few months, which we think is a retrafficking phenomenon. And in most patients, this normalizes in the ensuing two to four months and then gradually decreases even to below baseline levels, presumably because of effects on um, IL-4 producing or, or on Th2 memory cells. Um, the efficacy at the end of long-term treatment Remission has really not been accessible um, since combined endpoints have not been used. They've looked at things like exacerbations and isolation. And the efficacy after stopping treatment, at this point in time, we don't really have any studies examining the efficacy after stopping treatment. So we're really left with the possibility of, of again, hypothesis building. But if we look at some of the immunologic markers and follow them out over time after long-term treatment, um, and here we're following serum IgE during long-term treatment in patients with uncontrolled asthma during the pivotal trials. And, and what we can see is we're looking at patients who were initially on placebo and then got switched to dupilumab, patients who were on dupilumab and continued dupilumab after one year of treatment and following that going into an additional two years of treatment and then combining all patients in red. Uh, but we can see Again, in patients who come in off of a year of dupilumab and continue dupilumab for another two years, we, we see a significant reduction in IgE, but we, we never completely eliminate it. And we don't have good data of what IgE does off of therapy. Um, and there is some, some you know, credence to the thought that if you were to combine dupilumab plus immunotherapy in allergic patients, that you might have a potential for or long-term modulation of Th2 memory cell survival and, and presence in the systemic circulation. And this is actually a hypothesis that is being currently tested by Steve Durham using an allergic rhinitis model. If we look at eosinophilia, um, what we're really trying to show here is as patients go from um, therapy to either placebo to dupilumab or continuing dupilumab, um, we can see in the patients that go from placebo to dupilumab in the extension study that there is a bump up and that this comes down. And we can see that in, for the majority of patients who continue their dupilumab in blue, we can see that there's a reduction actually below baseline over a period of two years. Um, again, uh, blocking IL-4, perhaps having an effect on, on these Th2 memory cells with subsequent release of IL-5 which would then draw these eosinophils out of the bone marrow. And, and I think the number that's been quoted is about a 35% reduction at the end of this long-term treatment. Um, but again, um, we see the persistence of these cells even on therapy. And then if we look at the traverse extension and we're looking at exacerbations 
um, in the year before, and we're looking at patients from the phase 2b study and then patients from the phase 3 study. And we're basically looking at the number of exacerbations uh, at baseline. And then as we move into the middle panel, looking at the unadjusted annualized exacerbation rate, we can see that, in fact, patients are, are suppressed to a very low average number of exacerbations, going from about 2.25 or so down to about 0.25. So we're getting <clears throat> a, a marked enhancement of asthma control, but patients, many patients continue to have some disease activity. Um, and then in the far right, we're just looking at uh, FEV1 across time, and we're seeing that this certainly, again, is maintained, something that we did not see with mepolizumab in patients treated for multiple years of therapy. <clears throat> Which then takes us to the last molecule that we're going to talk about, and I think perhaps the one with potentially the greatest promise, um, thymextremal lymphopoietin. Um, there are other alarmants, of course, particularly IL-33, which does not seem to be nearly as involved in the genesis of, of atopy, um, much more of a role in viral-induced and potentially allergen-induced exacerbations through the ILC2 cell effects. Um, but if we look at TSLP, which is probably the most heavily studied of the alarmants, we certainly see this increased expression <clears throat> of OX40 and OX40 ligand in this pairing between the dendritic cell and the naive T cell. And when IL-4 is added, presumably from basophils, which are already in the system early in life, you end up with an allergen-specific TH2 cell. And TSLP modulates these TH2 cells to upregulate the amount of, of TH type 2 cytokines. And it has a similar effect on ILC2s which also play a very heavy role, both in non-allergic eosinophilic asthma, but similarly in, in, in allergic asthma. The mast cell has been shown to be modulated, at least in the skin, um, to a lesser extent in the airway. Um, and TSLP um, has an effect of increasing the amount of IL-4, 5, and 13 from these mast cells. Um, and then finally, there's an effect on increasing eosinophil activation with a, a subsequent increase in type 2 cytokines from these cells as well. And then finally, um, an interesting phenomenon that's being studied, there's some literature looking at the effect of uh, TSLP on smooth muscle, where there's certainly an effect on growth and contractility, but also on the ability to produce cytokines, including TSLP itself. So you end up with, in, in fact, a, a positive feedback loop with direct effects on smooth muscle. And this, this may be one of the, the linchpins in non-type 2 asthma, the role of, of these smooth muscle cells in the absence of type 2 um, or neutrophilic inflammation. So mechanistically, we know that tezapilumab has shown the ability to reduce exhaled nitric oxide, probably in the neighborhood of 40%, about what we see with inhibition of IL-4 and 13, a reduction in blood eosinophils. Here, we're probably looking at about a 50% reduction, um, not anywhere close to what you see with blockade of IL-5, and a reduction in IgE, probably about two thirds of what you achieve with IL-4 13 treatment. So what we see is not near, there is redundancy in the alarm and system and, and other regulators of these pathways. So you're not getting complete blockade by any means of IL-13, IL-5, or IL-4, but you're getting significant attenuation. Um, trials are completed um, looking at what happens when you stop treatment, and, and some of those results are pending. And the efficacy after stopping treatment, again, um, there's limited data upon which to base this. But if we look at during treatment, we can see the kind of um, reductions which occur very rapidly um, in real time. Um, with the modification of IL-13 and IL-5, we see very, very quick changes in levels of these biomarkers. <clears throat> and then with IgE, um, again, a similar phenomenon to what we see with IL-4 blockade, a long sort of drawn out reduction, which does continue past week 52. And then when we look at asthma exacerbations, similar to what we've seen with, with other drugs, um, the, the thing that really distinguishes this particular molecule is that there are significant effects, not only in the type 2 population, 
that we see with omalizumab, anti-IL-5, and dupilumab, but we're seeing significant effects in the low type 2 population. So what, what, where it takes us to is if you can block an upstream modifier of, of this entire system, can you potentially combine immunotherapy with this and, and potentially see some important effects? And uh, this was a multi-center trial that we'll be talking about. Um, and, and to kind of review the background for the study, uh, the immunology of atopy seems to be changeable, even with long-standing disease. We know that if you give immunotherapy to a, a 65-year-old, you still see most of the important markers that we're looking for um, are altered. And in these important targets um, with immunotherapy are TH2 memory cells, B memory cells, and T regulatory cells. And allergy immunotherapy affects these cell types, um, but in some patients, um, we can't achieve um, complete dosing, particularly in asthmatics. And I think really when we, we talk about um, combining these treatments, we're not talking about rhinitis. We're talking about patients with potentially severe, um, uncontrollable allergic asthma. And specific biologic medications do have effects on these cell types, uh, dupilumab and tezapelumab. And we're going to be looking specifically at tezapelumab in this case. So there was a, a large trial <clears throat> which went by the, or the, the nickname of catnip and recently published not too long ago. Um, Matt, who may be on this call, really played a, a very important role in looking at a lot of the data in the study and doing appropriate analyses that allowed us to make some, some very important conclusions. And, and what was looked at was combining immunotherapy plus tezapelumab. And what we're looking at first are the effects on cytokine levels. And um, what we're looking at are IL-5, IL-13 on the far left. And we can see that to basically paint a thumbnail sketch of the study, patients were randomized to receive either placebo, tezapelumab, CAD immunotherapy, or, or tezapelumab plus CAD immunotherapy. They were all treated with their respective treatments for a year period of time. And what made the study unique is that therapy was stopped at the one-year time mark, and then patients were followed out for a subsequent year. And what we were potentially hoping to see is that this combination therapy might suppress cytokine release by having an effect on T regulatory cells um, in the year off of treatment. But what we're seeing is, as we look at, um, when we're looking at the change from baseline uh, in nasal cytokines, we're looking at IL-5 on the left and IL-13 on the right, that there was a pretty prompt uh, recurrence um, that occurred during that first year off of treatment, um, not significantly different from the peak effects. And if we look at cat dander IgE and total IgE, very interestingly in this case, whether patients got tezapelumab or SCIT, or tezapelumab, or actually tezapelumab plus SCIT, or tezapelumab alone, shown in pink and blue, we can see a long meandering reduction in total IgE levels that continued after stopping treatment, which was um, an interesting finding, which we didn't see in SCIT alone, which is expected, um, which is shown in yellow. And if we look at total IgE, a, a similar phenomenon, um, that as you go from the patients who got tezapelumab plus tezapelumab plus skit, this long-term reduction, um, particularly in, in, well, in this case, higher in the tezapelumab than in the combo group. But as we uh, <clears throat> think about this, it, it turns out that with Matt, Matt's work that it appeared the mast cell was really playing the largest role in mediating um, the reduction in long-term symptoms that we did see in this study. There, there was a remission in symptoms that occurred a year after stopping treatment, which seemed to be mediated by a cluster of genes related to type 2 inflammation, particularly the mast cell. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to explore that data, um, but I would direct you all to the, to the original publication, which came out in Jackie um, within the last year. And I think that, you know, that it sort of points us in the direction that if we're going to achieve remission, it's probably most likely going to be in patients who have allergic disease rather than patients who have non-allergic disease. 
because we can not only potentially modify inflammation, but we're going to be modifying the immunology of the disease. And I think studies with tezapolumab paired with immunotherapy and asthmatics is something that is being currently looked at. So when we kind of look at all of the important bullet points in this regard, patients who have longstanding disease certainly may have irreversible inflammatory changes, um, which will limit what they can get back in FEV1 and perhaps what they can even get back in terms of symptoms and exacerbations. So when we, when we think about this, it's something that we would ideally jump into much sooner than later. Um, and, and I think if you look at the best candidates for remission based on prior work of spontaneous remission, it's patients who have recent onset, um, recent rapidly evolving asthma, who have a moderate severe phenotype and a treatable immunologic trigger. <clears throat> so, um, and I don't know how many of you have certainly treated patients who have the onset of asthma within the first one to two years. These patients go on immunotherapy along with standard of care therapy and anecdotally do much better and, and perhaps even go into remission. We don't have a lot of detailed data about this with immunotherapy and, and asthma, but, but I think as we look ahead, pairing it with a biologic, the biologic to achieve control and perhaps facilitate the actions of what immunotherapy might be able to achieve. And, and this is something I think that is going to be done and we'll have more data in about five years. Um, so to summarize, few studies have really looked at what happens with biologic treatment. The data we have um, tells us that while on therapy, you can get pretty good control and perhaps even complete control in some patients. Um, but not all. And um, a documentation of loss of efficacy has been shown after stopping both omalizumab and mepolizumab. And if we look at the phase three data from dupilumab and tesipilumab, the effects on IgE suggest that um, there may be persistence, um, even with stopping therapy, as we showed with tesipilumab. And the question is how long this will go on after a short course of therapy, we don't know yet. And um, future studies, I think, will really be critical in trying to gauge um, who are the best candidates, which is the best drug, and, and how long do you have to treat in order to try to achieve this. So thanks for listening, and I think we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Jonathan, thanks very much. You hear me? I do. Yeah. So one thing that intrigued me uh, early on, you highlighted the importance of blood neutrophils in persistence of disease, but you didn't come back to that point. Um, and so that seems like a paradox. Um, what do you think about that? I, I think it's interesting because we don't associate you know, neutrophilia with type two disease, although a recent analysis that was done, and I think it's in press right now, looking at dupilumab in patients who had blood neutrophilia above the median level. Um, I mean, the question is what's normal and what's not normal for blood neutrophils, which you know, I think is part of your point, is what do we define as abnormal? But at least if you look at the group as a whole and you take those people where there seems to be a relative in, in increase in neutrophilia, dupilumab had the same efficacy in those patients. Didn't have an effect on the neutrophilia, but it still continued to be efficacious. So the question is, what are the neutrophils doing? Are they, are they part of the pathogenesis of the disease or are they part of the, a, a compensatory mechanism to try to heal the airway um, you know, by releasing metalloproteinases and other, other things that really you know, have an effect on the collagen and are part of what we see as a sort of an augmented healing process, perhaps a little bit too exuberant. So, um, and the reason I, I can't go back to that point, Len, is because we don't really have any, other than the, OML, other than the dupilumab data, um, we don't have any data about that either in regard to how these treatments seem to work in the short term, and certainly none regarding how they um, work, you know, with long-term neutrophilia. So this really hasn't been looked at, but I think it's an interesting finding and, and probably we should include that in future studies. We've got a big audience here. Do we have any other questions out there? <clears throat> 
We've got one in the chat box here. When you look at the data on the severity of asthma with nasal polyp, what basically it's a question about the relationship of importance of nasal polyps of the question that I lost it there and and the persistence and severity of asthma. So is your meaning of the question, are the nasal polyps an independent factor or really are they just a marker for asthma severity? Um, hopefully that is your question. And, and the data to date doesn't really address that. Um, the nasal polyps were looked at, but they didn't do a multi, uh, multivariate analysis looking to see, is that just a marker for the severity of these patients or do the polyps have some other kind of importance? And, and I think we could speculate at least that the polyps might have additional importance. Uh, we know that polyps certainly are, are originated in this, this bath of IL-13 in the airway that leads to thickening of the basement membrane uh, and bulging of that, of that basement membrane through the ostium of the sinus. So, you know, maybe the nasal polyp is really a, a good in vivo marker for how much matrix is being laid down in the basement membrane by the action of IL-13. And, and, and therefore, as if we see that as a potential marker of, of long-term remodeling, then we could easily understand how that might make it a group of patients that would be harder to push into remission. So um, there, it may be a marker of severity. It may also be a marker for more advanced airway remodeling. I, mean, I, I think we always knew before we knew the immunology that adult onset or what we years ago used to call intrinsic asthma, sorry about the alarm clock, um, was with chronic rhinosinusitis was really the toughest disease to treat. That's right. Yeah. This is Vinod here, one of the community allergists. Thank you again for a very informative and very important talk. I, me might have alluded to, um, is there any difference again in any of these biologics specific to AERD, you know, asthma induced aspirin sensitivity? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a great question. And in, in AERD, um, you know, a lot of the work um, that Tanya Laidlaw has done, it really implicates IL-4 um, as a very important cytokine um, coming out of mast cells. and and you know, subsequently, we we understand that the leukotrienes are elevated in this disease, um, but it seems as if IL-4 seems to play a very important role in activating these mast cells and subsequently producing these these arachidonic acid metabolites. And and there has been work um, specifically with dupilumab, looking because it does such a good job of blocking IL-4, looking at the effects in AERD, both on aspirin challenge and and, and the long-term disease process. And um, it seems to be very effective in this group of patients. Um, my own clinical experience it would support that, that in people who, who I've even tried to do aspirin desensitization and, and not succeeded, um, dupilumab has been very effective. Um, I think you could speculate because of the effects on IL-4 with tezapilumab, that that may also be another potential approach, although it hasn't been tested yet. But in you know the case of omalizumab and, and, and the anti-IL-5 drugs, all three of them, um, there are anecdotal reports showing improvements, and I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be surprised that it would work. But at a fundamental level of pathophysiology, I think um, going more upstream in the, in the cascade is probably more useful. Thank you. You know, maybe a separate question. You know, just you know, how about say the ones who have the COPD, you know, asthma overlap in that, in those individuals, is there, again, I mean, think about physiolo pathologically what's happening in terms of treatments. And is your question about which biologic might do the best? Right, right. correct. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there were certainly huge, you know, development programs with the anti-IL-5 class, both with the receptor blocker, benalizumab, and with mepolizumab. And they were able to demonstrate that if you had an eosinophilic cohort of patients with COPD, now I won't use the COPD asthma overlap term because that wasn't what was used in the studies. Um, that is a very hard to de define phenotype 
from the FDA's perspective, because there's so many different definitions of what ACOS really stands for. But if at least if you take these eosinophilic COPDs, which you might picture are part of that spectrum, uh, the antile fives do have an effect on exacerbations. Um, dupilumab is looking at this, and, and tezapilumab is looking at this, this group of patients. Um, and you may not see the term ACOS used in these studies, but maybe more COPD with inflammatory markers um, consistent with what we see in type 2 asthma. Well, Jonathan, thanks very much for uh, a very valuable presentation. Hope to see you in person next year. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to present and wish you all a good day. Take care.